The story of how the psychedelic program came to be is actually intimately connected with Horizons. And now that we're looking ahead to the next 10 years, it's exciting to think about what more could come when something like this only took basically two years. People always ask us, what is psychedelic integration? Like, what are you doing? What's your protocol? What's your agenda? And uh, this is all very new for us. So we have our own experience with integration. We've kind of picked up little pieces of wisdom here and there, but we're learning and we're inviting in all sorts of people and uh, people who've been trained in all sorts of different traditions in a very collaborative, group-centered, uh, inclusive kind of approach so that we can learn how to best provide this thing called psychedelic integration for the community. And it's about attracting people with their own experience and wisdom to teach us about what's needed and for the community members to tell us what they need. Um, Andrew calls this a philosophy of abundance. When I asked him earlier today exactly what term he used, he couldn't remember, but it really stuck in my mind. So this term of abundance, that the more people that are called in to contribute, the, the more space is actually created for everyone to feel like they're getting what they need out of it. And that we're not here at the top telling everyone what integration is like. So we offer education, we offer training workshops, uh, individual therapy and community-based uh, drop-in groups uh, on a monthly basis. The Center for Optimal Living was a really rich base for the, our program. And just briefly to say that, you know, in terms of the technical aspects of it, you know, it's a CBT combined with dynamic conceptualization and mindfulness uh, techniques combined into psychotherapy. But what really is important is actually, it's about a non-judgmental approach to people's substance use. And generally when we think about substance use, we think about substance misuse or substance abuse. And uh, this is a community of people who are very, very stigmatized. And I think um, amongst people who use psychedelics, there's a similar kind of stig stigmatization. And so um, having a, a place where uh, a person's relationship to uh, a drug or multiple drugs are explored rather than something to be done away with, it naturally lent itself to uh, doing some sort of psychedelic integration work. This is from our launch event a year ago. That's Andrew up there at the podium. And we just want to acknowledge the amazing team of people that is supporting us. We wanted to create a kind of dream team of people who know way more than we do about psychedelic research, clinical practice, psychotherapy, and integration. We couldn't get everyone, you know, it's like I think eventually this slide will have 20 more faces on it and everyone will be involved, so we'll kind of be like the Switzerland of the psychedelic community. There are some people here who are much more in the indigenous shamanic world and we feel like that we could not have launched a program like this without having that as an integral part of our advisory board. And so we take that very seriously from the mental health field to doctors and also indigenous healers. What I've been motivated by is basically learning how to do psychedelic therapy, but not really having the opportunities to do so. So very briefly, um, back, I mean, I'm talking about now 10 years ago, eight years ago, looking at um, a follow-up to uh, LSD research in the form of Czechoslovakia. It was a way for me to talk to mental health professionals about their experiences, not just to do the science, but for me to maybe pick up on something that they were doing to learn about how I could do something similar one day. Um, with MAPS, Rick Doblin had mentioned adherence, so research looking at how therapists are following the manual for uh, the MDMA for PTSD therapy, and that's something that I supervised. So yet again, it's sort of a way for me to peer into the, the psychedelic or MDMA therapy without necessarily me being there. We, we're not giving people psychedelics, but what we can do with people who are choosing to do so or are maybe considering it, we can make sure that they're uh, investigating this or doing this in the safest way possible and in a way that can minimize uh, harm and potentially maximize the, the benefits of it. Great. Um, I wonder if you could take us into what a typical psychedelic integration therapy session looks like when you're working with an individual. The answer to that question really <laughs> is that there isn't uh, a typical psychedelic or integration session. So um, this kind of bumps up against a little bit of well, several different thoughts that I have. One important thing is to think about it not being sort of a one-size-fits-all uh, one approach. 
Um, and I want to really encourage people to think about um, the different sorts of level of functioning that a person may have when they are uh, maybe pursuing uh, integration work. There's people who are coming who may be wanting to engage in personal growth. There may be people who have some serious psychiatric illnesses or disorders that may need assistance. And so I think the therapy needs to kind of reflect that. There's this thought that, well, integration is just really about allowing a person's inner healing intelligence or their intuition or their process to unfold. And I think that's an absolutely essential aspect of psychedelic therapy, of integration. However, I think you have to also be very careful about what kind of person you're working with. And so when we're talking about individual integration work, I think uh, assessment, diagnosis, and having a formulation about what you're doing and who you're working with is really, really important. Um, I know this may not be something that we're typically thinking about when we're thinking about um, other kinds of approaches to, to integration, but this is sort of the way that we at the program, in terms of approaching individual work, that's how we think. So a thorough history, thinking about trauma, of course, and not just trauma that is interpersonal or trauma, traumatic events, but also maybe potentially how trauma could be a, a component of a person's psychedelic experience. If it was uh, very scary, or in some rare and very unfortunate cases where people were taken advantage of while under the influence of the psychedelics, which sometimes, uh, unfortunately and very sadly, happens. Integration is an unfolding process, so it's not like this is something that happens once after a person uses a psychedelic, but it's something that continues to unfold a person's uh, sort of thoughts and feelings and their, their growth takes a, a lot of time. And in that way, it's really important, I think, to be able to be uh, to be able to think about a person's uh, life and what they're presenting with, but at the same time, kind of being non-directive because you don't necessarily always know um, what is best, and that's something that Catherine had alluded to in the beginning of this talk. Sort of, we don't necessarily see ourselves as our, as experts. We kind of see ourselves as somebody who, who people who are kind of cushioning uh, their, this person's process through practice of uh, meditation or some physical exercise or music, some way to kind of hold on to the experience. I remember, I think it was Bill Richards who had, in one of his talks, had this really great comment. Uh, one of the participants in one of the psilocybin studies said, you know, how do I make this last? And he says, you know, do any, everything that you can. And um, that's something that I really hold on to and think about. We have purposely put ourselves in a pretty challenging position because we're saying we're going to start providing these services even though these drugs are still tightly controlled and restricted. And so I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the challenges that you see as being a psychotherapist about you know, working with psychedelics in an environment where psychedelics are so tightly restricted and illegal. Well, the thing that comes to mind the most is really um, some of the sadness that I think I experience as a, as a therapist working with people because this people are using the psychedel psychedelics or MDMA under less than optimal conditions for what they want to do. I mean, if the aim is to have some sort of therapeutic effect, uh, you know, we believe that the best way to do that is uh, in the presence of therapists in a controlled setting. And that's simply that uh, it's not available outside of the research setting. And, you know, like I said, or what I want to really emphasize, our program isn't about giving people psychedelics or connecting them to underground psychotherapy. We don't do anything like that. And so what happens is that uh, I, I or my fellow uh, team members find ourselves with people who are trying to get better and sometimes it's very difficult to kind of sit there and really uh, feel the sort of their, their suffering and also um, the limitations of where things are at currently in our sort of political climate, but um, also with the hope that, that that may change. I think people often conceptualize psychedelic integration being about some sort of, uh, if I can use the term, like a massive download or some sort of incredible, very intense, mystical-like experience that is difficult to sort of uh, to integrate, to make kind of sense of. And so far with who, the people we've seen, that seems to be less the case and more about really the day-to-day. -day. Um, things about navigating relationships or... Um, you know, just sort of day-to-day -day things that aren't necessarily so necessarily mystical in, in a way. Um, and another piece of that is... Um, well, you were talking earlier, it's something that stuck out when you were talking about working with individuals, is just um, 
if someone's in therapy, the change happens right. so gradually, but so they can kind of integrate it into their relationships, right. and it's not such a shock to their family or their friends right. when they're a totally new person. But right. So if we want to conceptualize uh, psychedelic therapy or MDMA therapy as something that that makes psychotherapy more rapid, then and and if it truly does work and there are rapid changes, it doesn't allow for, for example, like the family system to necessarily accommodate that change, and the family system may be sort of working towards an equilibrium or, or status quo, and maybe actually potentially working against uh, a person's improvement. So an example of this to make it a little bit more real would be uh, a, a woman who has a husband who has PTSD and she in, uh, experiences improvement, but the husband, his role in the family has been the provider and the caretaker. And what happens now when this, the woman no longer needs that kind of support anymore? What happens to the, the husband who's, whose role has now changed? And that can be positive, but it can also create some other things, some negative responses, and I think that's part of the integration work as well. Um, and the other thing that I might mention is also if we dynamically kind of conceptualize uh, partly symptoms as being uh, a defense or something that's a coping mechanism, if somebody, uh, say through MDMA therapy, begins to see through uh, their, say, maladaptive coping uh, mechanisms, but there may be a period soon after the MDMA therapy where the person begins to feel sort of some of the symptoms, maybe like uh, hyper, like activation or hyperarousal associated with the PTSD, um, but, no, but can kind of see through the, the coping skills that they used. I think it's really important to provide people with new coping skills uh, so that they can handle these different things that are coming up for them. This is a little taste of how we do the integration groups. I want you to put both of your feet on the ground and sit upright. I'd like you to close your eyes if that feels comfortable for you and we'll take some deep breaths. Breathing in through your nose and out through your mouth, just noticing where you feel the breath most strongly moving through your body. I'd like you to recall a, a single psychedelic experience or otherwise very intense experience from your past. And as you breathe, I'd like you to call in the body sensations of that experience into the present moment. What are you seeing? The visions in your mind and also how the world appeared. Without filtering, without judging, just allowing those visions to come back. And inviting in the ears. Very importantly, not thinking about hearing or thinking about seeing, but inviting those body sense organs to re-experience and inviting in your skin the sensations of touching then inviting in the nose smelling and the mouth the sensations of tasting we are creating a bridge that the body can recognize through these sensations allowing them all in knowing that you are safe right here if there was a person that was intimately connected with the experience for you, inviting them into the space right now, welcoming them in, thanking them. Take some deep breaths and open your eyes when you're ready, and we'll attempt to go back to our normal programming. Part of that experience that we all just shared together is how we start every group, and we help people connect as much as possible with their direct experience. And our philosophy is that each person is the expert of their own experience. And what I've found in facilitating these groups is that the more that I help create a safe container and help people connect with their own experience and then really get out of the way and only step in if things kind of start to go off track, people feel held and they feel safe to speak about their direct experience. And this is not talking about their experience. It's telling the story, but also inviting us all into their shared story. We've created this shared environment together to all be in the person's story with them. And something that I never really expected, but I saw happen time and again, is that the more time people had to really tell their story the way they needed to tell it, um, they would finally get to the deep point of the matter. And that was usually a space of um, emotion or potentially trauma or a wound um, or a space of very deep appreciation. And it's taken a while, I think, me as a facilitator and also the groups to feel comfortable 
Um, but after many months of doing this, people are really starting to open up into these very deep emotional, spiritual spaces in a way that uh, they feel safe and seen by everyone else in the group. And um, it's really amazing to see. And it's kind of like I learn something new every single time I'm in the groups. And um, I feel lucky that I just get to be there facilitating. And the less I think I know about what's going on, the more people are able to really connect with that direct experience. At Hopkins, as part of the spiritual practice study, I was uh, one of the head researchers and session guides, but I also had the honor of working with Mary Casamano, facilitating the high support spiritual groups where people would come every other week and um, everyone who had a high dose experience would uh, come together in a group, a small group, and talk about their experience. We had kind of exercises that they would do around spiritual practice and awareness. And I saw some really amazing stuff come out of that group process. So this is a ripple from that work. Um, and it's, it's a ripple that has widened and become, I think, less top-down. Since we're not doing a research study, we don't have any uh, particular interpretation or set of integration practices that we need people to do or want to kind of move them in that direction. So instead, we just kind of get to open up the space and learn from people telling their own stories and asking questions like, how do I do this? You know, one person asked me, how is DMT like how is DMT not like being a corporate lawyer? I was like, that is a very good question and you should keep asking yourself that question because I don't know the answer. That's been a real inspiration for me. But also, more recently, one of my teachers who's also on our advisory board, James Lohr, is talking about how integration involves the individual, the community, and also the cycles of nature. And so most of the psychedelic work focuses on the individual a little bit on community. We're entering at the point of the community and then helping kind of weave back and forth, ideally between the individual and these cycles of nature. But of course, we're in the middle of Manhattan and the cycles of nature are sometimes less apparent. So we're still kind of working on that piece. How do we connect people with something much you know, larger than themselves in their community? We're gonna be moving into a new space. The Center for Optimal Living is gonna be right ne next to Grand Central, basically, right in the heart of the city. Part of that space, in addition to therapy offices and a really nice little waiting room, is a larger group space that we're going to leave open rather than dividing up into therapist offices so that we can do more small group work, we can do body-based work, we can do meditation and yoga and sound journeys and trance rattling and holotropic breath work and everything but the drugs. And so it's going to be really awesome. It's going to be a sanctuary in the heart of the city and it will be a perfect place to see all of this through at least the next 10 years. And we see that place as being a hub for many different uh, allies and psychedelic ambassadors and people from all different walks of life to come and help us learn and to teach others. So we want this space to be a communal resource that benefits the program, benefits the center, helps our clients and our, and our guests, but also is a place for all of you to come and share what you know. And since it's our space, we can do what we want with it. And it's really, really exciting. I think that the future is going to include a lot of little places like that all over the country. I hope with as little regulation as is needed to maintain safety and as much freedom and access as possible. And I imagine a really exciting future and I hope a lot of it is focused right here in this amazing city that we're in. Please come to one of these groups and bring people that you know. We are trying so hard to reach out to people. Um, this uh, Bob Jesse was sharing with me earlier today that there's this idea of attraction, not promotion. We believe that what we're offering is needed in the community, but we don't want to be pushing anything on anyone. So it really depends on all of you actually coming to some of the events that we're offering, whether it's the monthly drop-in groups, which are only $20, $25. It's really low bar for entry. Bring people who you think might be interested. They don't have to have psychedelic experiences. Um, we'll be offering more small groups. Uh, you can try out the individual therapy too, if that's kind of, you know, so you're learning more about the therapist side of it by actually doing the therapy yourself. Um, we have a training workshop coming up that's all day long on October 22nd in collaboration with Sarah Gale from the Zendo Project, MAPS. 
Um, but we need, it's like we need the community to show up so that we learn better what we can provide. And I think in terms of how you can get involved, I mean, I don't know if Ingmar can speak more to that side of it with... Well, I guess just to echo what Catherine had said, um, so when I was in Prague at the Beyond Conference and I led a little integration group there, with the, the intention of it being able to spread. So we very much like uh, other groups like ours, to, and they, they do exist in, in other states, but we think it's important for it to spread. At the same time, I think, um, you know, the tension between peer support and um, somebody who has spent a very long time studying these, these topics, I think there, there's a tension there. And uh, being an MA student, I don't know what you're studying or what your field is in, but I think um, it's really important to uh, be able to be a good diagnostician, to be also equipped with the tools to help somebody with whatever they're working with. Um, and then a different role is maybe being in a group and providing peer support. Um, so there are different avenues of doing it, but uh, I kind of fall down on a little bit of the stricter side in terms of individual work and really having kind of a training to be able to do that. So pursuing that. But yeah, just, even just coming to the groups, I think you'll get a much better sense of kind of our approach and it's an amazing community of people that are already showing up and we think that that's just kind of the tip of the iceberg, that there's a lot more people who are interested, have things that they want to share, are unsure about, and um, we're hoping that if every one of you, you know, if you can, comes to one of these groups and brings, you know, tells two other people or brings someone with you, then it'll kind of start to spread more organically and we can, I think, learn more how to best address these needs. I think it probably varies from place to place, but I also have to say that like I'm one of those people that works in those settings. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> um, and so I've seen yeah I've seen variation in terms of the quality of the care, um, but I do think that at least in the setting that I I worked at, uh, there actually is a lot of awareness of. Um, you know, the, the fallout from synthetic cannabinoids and also treating people with respect and understanding sort of the line between something that might be a psychotic disorder and something maybe like a, a spiritual emergency. I mean, it really depends on who you encounter, but um, there, there is, I think, a, a continuing emerging awareness of that. And in terms of um, what uh, I, I, one of the missions of our program really is, which I really want to do more and more of, is ex addressing exactly what you had mentioned, which is training uh, mental health professionals to understand the motivations behind why some of their clients might be using psychedelics or MDMA, so that um, they're better equipped to respond in an appropriate way, um, wh whatever that may be. Yeah, it's a very important... Uh, yeah. I don't know, I guess the, the part of your question is kind of how can the trained professionals get more okay going into these wacky places with people? I mean, so, um, I mean, one way is for those trained professionals to do their own experiences, but that's probably not something that you, I mean, let's just put that one aside. Um, so I was, I was helping lead a sanctuary space at a festival out on the West Coast, and this woman came up to me and she said, well, I'm not interested in psychedelics, and I don't do them, and I'm not even curious, but should I still go, come to your workshop about holding psychedelic space? And I said, I think so. And she sat through the whole thing, and she said, what, what you guys are describing and illustrating of how to be with people and how to hold space for people applies across the board to all these different um, environments. And so... Um, maybe some of the peop people you work with would love to come to one of our workshops where a lot of, some of what we're talking about is very specific to psychedelics, but a lot of it could be applied more broadly to really intense psychiatric situations um, and how to do harm reduction and, and holding space and working with integration. So, um, But if you have ideas in particular of how we could help educate and create that connection, I mean, we'd be all for it. Absolutely. In some ways, we, I think, have like our finger on the pulse of at least what's happening in New York City, and New York City is a very unique environment, but in terms of the substances that people choose to use um, and uh, how they go about using them, so particularly I'm thinking about ayahuasca or I'm thinking about microdosing, things that are sort of shifting, and um, you know, I, I guess our, our, our approach to that is it depends, but I think it's really the, the group coming together to, to help each other. Uh, and sometimes they know more than uh, uh, about, they, they are better supports than we are for them as yeah, the leader. Sure. I mean, something I guess 
maybe the, there's a kind of subtext to your question. I'm not sure I understand all parts of it, but um, there was a, a, a panel recently led by one of our advisory board members, Dimitri Mujanis, and, uh, about psychedelics and race. And we wanted to continue the conversation that he started with this question, why is the psychedelic community whiter than the Tea Party? And um, when all of these traditions come from people who don't have, most of them don't have white skin. And so um, where are those people? Where are the voices? Why are they not up in front of, you know, big crowds? Um, they're doing a lot of the actual healing, ceremonial work with communities that are that we haven't really created those bridges with. And so um, we are continuing that conversation the best way we can through one of our groups coming up in December. It's on psychedelics and social change. Maybe it's not as obvious, but I haven't seen as much shift in the kind of these broader, more systemic problems. And Dimitri talks about a structural analysis that certain plant medicines with certain ceremonial um, rituals can actually take you out of your little individual kind of idea about what your mind and self is. So rather than just integrating your idea of what you are, you're kind of breaking open that idea and kind of and sending those shoots and connections out into the world. Um, but I don't have an answer, and I think we're trying to explore that. And um, if, if our program can be a part of extending things from the individual out into the community to actually affect change for people who have never heard about psychedelics and don't even care about them, I think that that would be a huge contribution.